Welcome back to Solomon's Porch Podcast with your host Jason and Sean. And we are back with another round five. So this week's round five is going to be just a little bit different. Uh, this is a list of five things that I came up with. And these are items or ideas or theological views, I guess, that have changed my mind based on reading the Bible. Now, this is not a Bible study, so I don't have all the scriptures ready to share to show you why I don't. Well, I've changed my mind on these things, um, but I'm going to share them with you. If you disagree, hey, do it in the comments, do it in a friendly way and share scripture because maybe you'll change my mind back. But uh, Sean, you're just going to kind of contribute to the conversation on this list. Yeah, I'll have an honorable mention at the end, but I'll save it for the last. All right. So um, so the the first thing I got is that God does not call everyone to be married. And I say this because I think whenever we were looking through Genesis and we see, you know, God said to Adam or God said it was not good for Adam to be alone. Uh, I think that is true, but I will say that I don't think it's called for everybody because if you read later in scripture, especially the new Testament, when you got Paul, it says, or he says, you know, I would prefer you not get married. It'd be easier to do ministry if you were single. So, and I think that is a really good reason why we shouldn't say that everybody should be married. Now, a side note, a lot of people say you shouldn't be married because Paul was never married. Well, I read from Tony Evans, he had a a good, and I've actually heard one other person say it since I read it from Tony Evans, but a lot of people think that Paul was actually married before he, he, became a disciple for Jesus. Uh, happy Sunday, Mache. Shout out to you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. Um, so yeah, so a, a lot of people, uh, well not a lot of people, but I heard a couple people say that they think Paul was married because he was part of the, the leading council at that time. And that particular council he was a part of, you had to be married. So he left from that council and then he was criticized by that council later. So... Whenever he says, you know, you should be like me, that you're not married, that could be mean that you're not married anymore, that he wasn't married anymore, uh, which also kind of makes sense whenever you have the other scripture where he's talking about marriage and he's thinking about, well, if you're a Christian and you're, your spouse is a non-believer, you should stay with them. That way you can influence them in order to come back to Christ or come to Christ. Uh, doesn't say you should go and find a project to marry in order to try to get someone to Christ ahead of time, but... You know, uh, so there's a lot of things that he shares about marriage and that, that might be the reason, but, but then doesn't that sort of condone divorce? It doesn't condone. Well, he does talk about, so there's a three hour video from Mike Winger that talks about marriage, remarriage and divorce. Uh, very interesting video, a lot of in-depth thorough teaching and in conclusion is there are, there is a call for, there is a. Re- accept- acceptable reasons to get divorced. Now, I don't tell people that particularly. I don't like saying, hey, there are reasons you should get divorced because in my mindset, I look at marriage and I see that, you know, with God and Israel. All the times that Israel cheated on God in the marriage context of God and Israel, bride, that kind of stuff. Uh, God never turned his back on them. He was always there whenever they called. He always forgave them over and over and over and over again. We're called to forgive 70 times 7 uh, or 70 times 77, however you read the that particular thing. But I feel like the, as many times as I've cheated on Jesus with my, whether sin of some sort of sin nature, uh, he's always accepting me back. So, um, Mache says, LOL, amen, definitely doesn't tell us to find a project to marry. That's true. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but I do think that, um, I do think that it's just important to know that I don't think everybody is called to marriage. The Bible doesn't teach that everybody is called to marriage. Uh, it doesn't say man doesn't have a woman. So he has to have a woman. And every woman has to have a man in their life. So it's just not in the scripture. Well, I think the other thing, quick note there is that it, the way that ministry was viewed at the time is different than the, um, some a lot of ministry works today. Um, because it, if we take into account that uh, student ministry, uh, it's really valuable 
to actually have both a man and a woman, preferably somebody married. One, so that way young people who only have single parent homes uh, have a good example of, of what they can, um, how a, a marriage is supposed to hopefully look. But then also an opposite gender isn't going to an opposite gender having difficult conversations um, about whatever's going on in life. So, and of course that's also valid uh, as adults as well, but definitely very much so in student ministry. Absolutely. Yeah. Number four, <clears throat> drinking alcohol is not a sin. There's actually, again, Michael, Mike Winger did a very good video uh, on thorough uh, alcohol in the Bible drinking and whatnot. And, um, and there's a lot of areas in scripture where it talks about drinking alcohol to make you joyful, to make you feel better, and to uh, to to get you healthy. And, and I say this because as a kid, you know, whenever I was going to, you know, I'd hear in certain church settings, like drinking alcohol is, is, is bad, it's a sin, um, you shouldn't do it. They talk about the new wine having non-fermented, so the wine that Jesus had uh, had no effects to it in regards to making changing any way that you feel essentially grape juice essentially grape juice and i actually learned from a uh from chuck missler in reading studying john the story where he turned the water into wine that actually the wine actually would have had some ferment in it uh based on the timing of the agricultural and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. in that they couldn't store it and and so it would have fermented over that time anyway um so Drinking alcohol in itself is not a sin. The Bible does say not to get drunk. It says don't be a drunkard. It says be of sober mind. So you shouldn't drink to the level where you can't think clearly. You can't make rash decisions, things like that. But drinking alcoholic beverage every now and then is not a bad thing. Unless well, it's not a sin. It's not a sin. Now, use wisdom. If you struggle with alcoholism, if you don't know how, if you can't draw a line somewhere, just stay away from it. Uh, Paul talks a lot about not doing things that you, and, and there's another thing. I'm not telling you to drink alcohol if you think it's bad. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is drinking alcohol in itself is not a sin. If, if you feel like God's telling you to stay away from it, stay away from it. Paul does say to follow your conscience in those matters. So um, I might get a lot of pushback on that from certain people, but oh, well, I don't think those people will watch YouTube though. They probably watch like kitty cats playing around and stuff. Um, number three. God and Satan are not opposite but equal, okay? I think a lot of people have this concept that that Jesus and Satan are like on on equal playing fields and one's one team, one's the other, and they're fighting over us, right? Uh, that's not the case. And in Scripture, uh, yeah, you, you blanked out, my friend. So if you join back in, I'll add you to it. Um, in Scripture, Satan is conquered by an angel, Angels don't have anywhere the power that God or Jesus has. So if an angel is able to take over and knock Satan down to the pits of hell and strike him down, things like that, then there's there's not an accurate idea in Scripture of Satan and God like fighting each other. That doesn't happen. Whenever Satan tried to usurp God in heaven, God immediately psh, struck him down. I mean, it wasn't like a, a battle for the crown or a battle for the throne. That, that didn't happen. Uh, Satan got struck down pretty clearly. And so, anything to add to that? Um, Incredible Hulk versus Hawkeye. Incredible Hulk versus Hawkeye? Yeah. I, I, no contest, right? I mean... Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, you, you've, got, you've got God, <clears throat> Incredible Hulk kind of scenario. Right, so right. Hawkeye, which is Satan. You know, it, you know... Is, is Satan putting up a fight? Maybe, yeah, sure. But there's really no contest. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I thought you were... <laughs> I thought you were changing topics. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Just, <laughs> just trying to still keep it geeky. Yeah, absolutely. So, number two. This is a big one. This is a very big one. Uh, you will have to, to study Old Testament in order to understand this. The modern-day church is not a replacement of... Of Israel. You're going to have to expand upon that. So the modern day church is not a replacement of Israel. So there's a lot of ideas in the church, that are in, in today's church, that anything the Bible says about Israel 
is also true for the church. Uh, and what that what happens is, is you read Old Testament scripture about things that God's promising to Israel. And you're taking those same promises and you're applying them to us today in the body of Christ. Now, that is called replacement theology. And that is not a biblical concept. There are spiritual things that were promised to Israel. The the spiritual realities that were given to Israel can be true for the church today. Those who are found in Christ. And that's why it says those who were saved are the true Israel. Those who were uh, in Christ Uh, Those are the true people of God, the true children of God. So we can't, and this is done a lot, and I've heard a lot, and I've heard a lot of questions and Q&As and stuff about it. And again, I'm not bringing out 100 scriptures to be able to prove this point here on the show. Uh, If you disagree with me, tell you why you disagree with me in the comments, and I'll be glad to, we can have a healthy exchange on that. Or I can guide you to people who have studied it well more thoroughly than I have. But I am thoroughly convinced that, the, the modern day church does not replace Israel of the Old Testament. There are promises given to them that are not true for the church. There are physical promises to them. There are inheritance promises to them. All sorts of things that just don't make even make any sense if you try to apply them to the modern day church. So we've got to stop doing that. Um, another thing I'll say, there's a difference in Israel and the church. The Israel is a nation of people that were governed by God, the church is a body. The whole entire concept of it is different. The church is the body of Christ. So the Israel wasn't the body of Christ, but the church is the body of Christ. So there is a different concept there. So uh, so we could go more on the difference between the church and Israel, but we're not going to. The very last one, the very last one, and I say this because there's multiple, multiple reasons why I say it. But... In our American society, with you know Passion of the Christ or the, you know different movies that come out, the Son of God movie, is that Jesus did not look like me, or Sean, or Jim Caviezel, or the actor but, that plays. But more closely related to Jim Caviezel, yeah, Jim. So Jesus was of a darker skin tone. He was from the Middle East. And in scripture, it talks about him going down to Egypt, which is in Africa, right? Yeah, but I mean, it it varies in, in, it does, it does, it does. So, but he, he blended in with those in that area now, but that, that doesn't make him that. I'm not saying he's black. I'm just saying he's not white. And, and I'm not saying he's not black either, but, um, most likely he, he's just brown skinned with dark hair he's middle eastern is exactly what he was here on yeah Earth. yeah yeah <laughs> so um and 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 again that still has varying degrees in it so i mean you know because again yeah. that, that area is so diverse so. exactly yeah and i say that because one of the issues that we have one is i remember as a kid you know i had a, a period in my life where i would say i was definitely prejudiced uh, for multiple reasons, and I won't go into that here. I've already talked about that in previous episodes of the show. But I remember thinking there was an episode of Good Times that I watched. And they had a picture of Jesus up on the wall. I know my. That the mother had there, and she liked that Jesus. She was used to it. It was always there. Well, then her son brings in this painting of a black Jesus. And the mother got mad. She got upset. And I did too. And I was trying to figure out, like, you know, I don't understand why, you know, Jesus, you know, he looked like this. He was a white guy. And as a kid, I got so upset because, like, I took, like, a personal, it felt personal to me where they were trying to say, he didn't look like you, he looked like me. Or he didn't look like you, he looked like somebody else. I felt like they were telling me that I was less than in a way. Where at the same time, in that anger, I was making the person of a different skin color less than without realizing it. Mm. So the one thing that we'd like to do is we like to make Jesus look like us. That's one thing that we do or any hero or whatever. We like to make them look like us, which is what Michael D'Angelo is it Michael D'Angelo the guy that painted the last supper. I can't remember. Anyway, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, yeah. Michael, yeah. D- Michael D'Angelo is Michelangelo. D'Angelo. Yeah. Um, either way, <laughs> <laughs> Michael D'Angelo. 
<laughs> That's funny. So he he made this image of Jesus, which which inaccurate, and um, but just in general, though, one thing that we have to, and I think another thing is historically, um, you look at Jesus as being looking this way, and, and you might think, well, if I look like this image of Jesus, that makes me more important than somebody else. And so we want to have an and one honestly, I, I don't think the physical look of Jesus matters in a in a, a spiritual eternal mindset. Having an accurate description of him physically, I think it's more it's better to be more correct than not correct. I mean, he wasn't a dog, he well, wasn't a woman, he wasn't a child for you know. And and the, pro- baby the problem is is that you're you're then worshiping, you're idolizing this visage that is yeah. nothing that we've been called to do. And if in anything yeah. we have biblical reason to not worship any kind of uh, idol whatsoever. Uh, and and it was Le- uh, Leonardo um, da Vinci that painted the Last Supper. I was way off then. Yeah, I, it was one of those Ninja Turtle guys. But anyway. Um, you know, yeah, and and that that's the problem. I don't have, <clears throat> I have an image. I, I actually, I, I have a couple of different images of uh, Jesus in terms of artwork that are in our home. Um, the one that's most specific, um, places him with a more Middle Eastern kind of look to him. Right. Uh, right. the other one is actually um composed of a bunch of words, so you don't really see him him. <laughs> Right, right. But anyway, yeah, it's it, it's one of those things that's always kind of bugged me too. But yeah, yeah. To me, it's not. It's. I mean, I'm not going to try to know exactly what he looked like. Uh, even scripture is really unsure. We can make assumptions based on some of the things in scripture what he looked like. Uh, even in regards to certain scriptures that talk about him physically, there's not a whole lot of detail there. Uh, you got a revelation where there's a glorified image of him, but it involves imagery, which is beyond anything we can really think of, like like uh, eyes like flames. Like, does that mean Jesus walked around with flames in his eyes? Like a sword as a tongue? Like he didn't walk around with a sword hanging out of his mouth. And so then there's another one with the transfiguration where it says his face was white and shining. Does it mean his face was white? doesn't really matter. That's not the importance here. These are all glorified images. We're given glorified images of Jesus. Jesus, um, visions of him at his most heightened power in a way. Right. And so his regular day-to-day wasn't exemplified necessarily through Scripture. So I think, and it goes back to, to the second commandment, don't worship any uh, idol or image. Um, I know that's that's not specifically talking about a a picture of Jesus we have in our head, but I do think it's dangerous to it's try to guidance. to in, in, envision a person that we're worshiping because if it's not Jesus and we read scripture and it differs from what, I just don't want to stay away from that myself. Yeah, so that's well, my two cents on that. Well, and and here's here's the uh, this is going to lead into my honorable mention. Okay. Um, if you can't find it in scripture, if it's not there, then it probably wasn't really important to begin with. So if we don't have details as to what Jesus looked like, oh, he was born and he was 3.5 pounds and, you know, 11 ounces. I, I don't know, whatever. Right. Then it wasn't important. He had blue eyes and blonde hair and was a strapping young lad. Well, it doesn't say, so it's not important, right? So, other things that I feel like <laughs> that are not important because I have it's... no idea. I have no idea <laughs> sure, what sure. you're going to say here. Sure, completely oblivious. <laughs> Stuff that is not emphasized in the Bible, so we make assumptions, and that is the celebration one of Christmas slash birthdays. So, you know, it wasn't done. It was actually celebrating birthdays was something that was just actually abhorred by the people of the time anyway, um, because it, it's self glorifying, and there's no mention in the Bible of them celebrating birthdays, 
And Jesus' birth is only mentioned in two out of the four Gospels and barely in one of those two Gospels. And the one that has the most information is the one that's specifically dealing with prophecy fulfillment. And so there is nothing biblically supported to say that we need to be celebrating Jesus' birth. So as much as we can say, hey, look, there's nothing biblical to say that Jesus was white um, or any other kind of attribute, there's nothing that says that we should be celebrating his birth either. So uh, Someone should write an article about that. Yeah, I think so. There's, there's probably has, has one somebody, somewhere. Some, yeah, it's probably coming, though. Coming soon to a Solomon Sports Podcast website near you? Yes, probably so. All right. Y'all keep a look out of that. Someone's probably writing an article that has something to do with not celebrating birthdays. So, yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, so that's our round five. If you have any that you'd like to add anything, you know, let us know. What is something that you thought at at one point, but then reading scripture made you think else or changed your viewpoint on it? Uh, I think it is important to be able to recognize those moments where the Bible has changed our minds. Uh, part of the reason why I thought about this was because I was watching an interview between Sean McDowell and a progressive pastor, and they were discussing about homosexuality, what the Bible says about it, whether it's acceptable, whether it's a sin. And the progressive pastor asked Sean McDowell, he said, have you ever had a change of mind on a theological viewpoint based on reading scripture? And he said, yeah, and he named off several things. And then I was thinking to myself, I wonder if I've done the same. Like, you know, I thought about that when I was watching the interview. Like, what are some things in my life that I've changed my viewpoint on after reading scripture? Because, like, there's no way I have everything right. Well, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because even recently I began to question things that I thought that I knew. And as a result, I said, you know what? And it was actually about homosexuality. And I said, you know what? I'm going to dive back in and I'm going to do the research. I'm going to look up what are the meaning of the original words. I'm going to look at the context. I'm going to look at uh, what was going on in society, what was acceptable, what was not, those sorts of things. Because those are usually the arguments that come up, right? And, and so it actually drove me to want to dig back in and to make sure that I really did know what I thought that I knew or did I know what I thought that I knew? Now, of course, I did it as objectively as I possibly could. I worked really hard to be able to make sure that I was as even keel on on my assessment as, as, I, as I could uh, possibly be. And I think that's something that we should all do and, and even go back through and re-question the things that we think that we truly know to be true to say, is this still accurate? Am, am, am I still? still feel like that I'm standing firm on biblical um, foundations here. Because again, the way that we've read something or the way that it's presented to us at certain times can be slightly skewed. And then we go back and we re reread them and go, mm, not so much. Or we go back, reread them and go, oh, yep, nope, that's definitely legit. Yeah. Whatever the case is. It's important to do that. And this is not the same as deconstructing your faith. I call it constructing <laughs> accurately constructing your faith because i think yeah. we're always constructing our faith we're always constructing what we th you know what we know what we've learned there's never a completed structure of faith in our lives or there shouldn't be we should always be learning and growing at a bare minimum reaffirming what we thought we knew based on what we're reading in scripture right um so yeah so anyway anything else to add man is that it that's it, bro. All right. We'll be back with another segment. Stoon. Stoon I keep Stoon. doing that. Stoon. Yeah. We'll be back with another segment. Stoon. <laughs> it's all right. Say it, Sean. Say it. Uh, we'll be back soon. Bye-bye. See you later. <laughs>